Namotasa Bhagavato Rato Samma Sambuddhasa Namotasa Bhagavato Rato Samma Sambuddhasa Namotasa Bhagavato Rato Samma Sambuddhasa Udang Dhammang Sangang Namasami <coughs> So it's a experience that the Buddha, the path of the Buddha, the way the Buddha is talking about, is really <clears throat> one of direct experience. It's not a philosophy or a metaphysical understanding about the nature of the universe uh, or why things are the way they are. Where it all came from, uh, but it's aimed uh, at the end of suffering, or the end of stress, the end of unsatisfactoriness, the end of restless hunger and disappointment. Mm-hmm. So it's very much a felt experience, you know. And the one of the simple expressions is nibbana paramang sukang nibbana, which is what the uh, whole process of the practice is about Nibbana unbinding or cooling or releasing putting out fire this is the is a metaphor Paramang for our highest welfare Sukang ease mm. which is for our highest ease supreme ease mm. best kind of ease you know there are plenty of different kinds of ease aren't there Sukang, pleasure, happiness, or I like to call it ease. It's a little more uh, relaxed, restful, because it really is the the ease of being free from stress and friction rather than the happiness of having a particular thing happen. It's the ease of having something not happen. (laughs) Removal. (laughs) And if you think of it in that way, it it does kind of attune one's uh, approach to be looking into not so much about you know what we have but but freeing ourselves from what we seem to have <laughs> uh, that's difficult or disappointing or or doesn't go very far you know so it's very much a clearing away process to to in the sense of when it's ease it's like you've cleared away the things that cause distress mm. Uh, no, you know, sometimes you know things about like Buddhism is about ultimate truth, and but you don't really see the Buddha talking about ultimate truth. Uh, he talks about uh, even ultimate. Paramang just means the best. Ultimate sounds so kind of uh, you know, like theory, metaphysical. The best, best kind of ease, quite simple, concrete. Buddha's language is very earthy and concrete. The best kind of ease. Look at it like that. That which goes the furthest. And when he talks about truth, there are different kinds of truths. Um, but the best kind of truth, you know, you can say it's true to call a hammer a hammer, that's a truth. <laughs> the best kind of truth is the truth about uh, uh, the suffering ceases. Because that, that goes furthest. That's, that's universally applicable. But it's not as if there's some kind of ultimate truth that you have to be able to get. 
or conceive or arrive at. You know, there are there are truths such as the four noble truths that are the best kind of truths. They're the truths that help you to understand why you're not uh, happy and help you to understand how to clear that. So it's the most useful form of truth. Other forms of truth have their use, but the truth of suffering is the most useful for this particular purpose. Other kinds of truth deal with arithmetic and they're useful too, but uh, in their own in their own respect. Yeah. So it's not as if they're even, you know, like we're looking at different levels of reality. It's only we're only talking about one level of reality, you know, one kind of reality. And there are different value truth have, different kinds of truths have different values, different kinds of happiness have different values. And you're looking at what's the best kind of happiness, the best kind of truth. Hmm. Yeah. And how do you know what's best? Because it's there most continually. It's there most continually and it covers the most. It covers the most circumstances. Arithmetic's only going to get you so far. Ending suffering is going to cover everything. Ending stress, why one experiences stress, that's going to cover a huge range of one's activities, one's um, relationships, one's actions, uh, one's aging, one's death, and separation from the loved. It's going to cover all that. So it's the most useful and productive and and, and fruitful kind of uh, truth. Mm. So that's why it gives you the greatest ease. Because it can give you ease in, in situations which are not very easy at all. You know? And it's the cultivation of what is it that needs to be cultivated to arrive at quality of ease, which is unusual to feel at ease with. <laughs> you know, or we feel a bit challenged, or bored, or you know, edg- edgy, or nervous, or twitchy, or something or the other. Yeah. How do you cultivate ease with that? And this is really. Where meditation is very helpful because you're dealing directly with um, how the how uh, how we operate, how the mind operates. Mm-hmm. That covers everything. You cover the mind. You cover everything. You know everything that you can cover. Mm-hmm. And just to be you know clear about what what we mean by that, because mind itself is a bit of a conundrum as to what. We have this uh, system of thinking, uh, organizing thoughts, organizing, creating particular finite thoughts that pop up, come and go. We can call that mind, if you like. It's really the mind um, organ. You have another kind of uh, mentality, which we'll call awareness. And the word is chitta. You have two words. So the mind that thinks and organizes, the organization experience concepts is, is mano and a sense of uh, that which is aware receives sensitizes responds is affected comes up with impulses gets disturbed calms down that's chitta that's called that awareness and the two are closely related the relationship is rather like the boss and the secretary and chitta is the boss and the, the mano is a secretary. So the boss says, hey, make me happy. Yeah. And the secretary says, okay, what shall I do? I'll go out and get a pizza. Um, uh, <laughs> I'll do something or the other. So it rushes around trying to think of something to make the boss happy. The boss says, no, I didn't. No, that's, not, that's pretty good, yeah, but now I want another one. I'm fed up with that. And so he rushes off. Mano goes off and thinks of something else he can come up with. Yeah. <laughs> And this, uh, this quality of awareness kind of permeates the eyes, the ears, the nose, and it keeps kind of moving around in those and uh, sends, sends a secretary out through the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, looking for something to make me feel okay, make me feel complete. Yeah. 
the secretary is following the orders as best he can. Yeah. But probably if you're a secretary and you have a boss, you realize sometimes the boss is just stupid. <laughs> Comes out with all the orders and demands, but actually needs a stern talking to. <laughs> and so that's what we're trying to get some feedback on, you know, start reporting. Hey, that thing, you know, that you, that you wanted is going to make me, you said, go, this is going to make me happy. I gave it to you and it didn't make you happy, did it? <laughs> it wasn't that, it was cut me a little bit, but it didn't give you the highest ease. Yeah. <laughs> so this is where this operation between these two, we, the mono faculty, the thinking mind, is able to conceive and report, report back. And you're listening. Yeah, it's true. Mm. 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 So gradually educating awareness to realize when it's giving the wrong orders or looking for the wrong things till it becomes clearer. And uh, as it becomes clearer and stronger, it really does become worthy, a worthy uh, boss, you know. You know but it has to be trained and educated. Mm. Mm. So this is why, you know, lengthening one's attention, really following through on what are the results and cause of one's actions and results of what one does. And how true was that thing that I imagined it was going to be like this and did it work out that way? And my opinions about myself and other people, how, what do they feel like? And are they true? Are they always true? Partially true? A little bit true? Hmm? Well, no, not finally true, are they? Not completely true. And the more that we uh, realize in order for the awareness to be really intelligent, it has to uh, be steadied, calmed, uh, cared for, fed. Yeah. <laughs> And so a lot of our practice is just about feeding, calming, steadying, awareness. So we stay with something. We stay with breathing. We become aware of our body. Breathing. Staying with it. So your awareness becomes stronger and more steady. Less impulsive. Less frenzied. And you bring thoughts of goodwill and intentions of goodwill into your awareness it starts to make it feel more friendly and loved and happy hmm? yeah, so you cultivate you feed it because you feed it it's going to it's going to really become something that will pay off it will really be that which will be a true leader of the mind give the true orders of the mind and what becomes possible over time is, is this um, uh, it's called insight or vipassana mm -hmm. so you have various sort of forms of, of understanding that you that become apparent and they're all aimed really at, well one of their aims is, is just feeling happy or easeful so when you develop the understanding of ethics you begin to recognize, yeah, this does make life a lot better. Less furtiveness, less deceit, less regret, less enemies, less things to worry about. You know, feeling clearer. That's, that's a weight off my mind. Hmm. And you develop more collectedness. So you're steady and clear with what you're doing. There's a kind of happiness that comes with that. The happiness of composure calm, collectedness. You start to really learn that. Yeah. Just because it's almost like you're using collectedness to, to clear to your nervous system. I was saying earlier in the week, you know, like the amount of stuff that has to run through our nerves, the nervous system, Everything you see, everything you touch, everything you taste, everything you think sends an impulse 
isn't it? Through through your nervous system, you feel it. Something, oh, what's that? Jolt, jump, and lots of messages about imperatives and urgencies and things to worry about, and yeah, things to have an opinion of. All that traffic rushing through <laughs> you know, your nervous system, and sometimes extremely high voltage. Hurry up, get this done, you know. Or with violence, or threats coming in, or with uh, worry and fear coming in, all that processing through this system. Till it eventually just like, you know, jumpy and, uh, and agitated and tight and tense and fearful and depressed because it's just completely, you know, loaded up with the wrong, <laughs> all this stuff running through you, you know. So the concentration or collectedness isn't, isn't really about acquiring something, or it is, but it's really about losing something. It's about, you know, clearing out, steadily calming, clearing out these, all these uh, waves and ripples and shocks and distortions that are going on. It's like at a certain point, if you in you know even studying the brain function, there's a certain point in which the the part of the brain, the hippocampus, which supervises all the brain functions, if it gets too much input, it just doesn't function. You know, like you have a you have an immediate. Uh, functioning responsive thing with the amygdala which just comes out with sharp emotional responses if you have too much of that happening it produces this substance it's called cortisol and it floods floods the brain so a certain amount of of if there's too much charge too much emotional pressure too much urgency too much fear too much worry too much defensiveness Basically, <laughs> you're flooded with this chemical, and your brain doesn't function, you know, or it, its function is severely impaired. This is nothing, you know, it's just just sheer, you know, chemistry of what people have to deal with. So the able, the sense of supervising, the supervisory capacity just basically gets drunk on this chemical, and uh, you know. People can't see things clearly anymore. You know? Gee. So you're trying to, you know, concentration is some sort of thing where developing prowess, who can get the highest marks. But, you know, it's like very pragmatic. How do you start to get sane? <laughs> more and more sane. How do you start to, you know, let those shock waves and the chemicals die down? Till you're actually coming into sanity, to clarity. Hmm? What are you? Re- what are you letting go of? What are you clearing out? So you don't really think of it like that, you know. What can we clear out now? What can we? So a lot of our concentration practice is just: what do I not need to think about? Yeah. What's just, um, and what's just stuck and useless? And of no purpose, you know, thinking, worrying, remembering, fearing, anticipating. How much of that can be just cleared, released? And when you start to cultivate ethics, you keep coming back to that theme as, because of this, I don't have to worry. Because of this, I don't have to regret. Because of this... I don't have to feel guilty. Because of this, I don't have to feel inadequate. Because of this, I don't have to feel I'm not good enough. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you keep coming back to that, and then the sense of ethics becomes a main support in concentration, because it gives you something to take refuge in. Mm-hmm. When a lot of the signals are saying, Work harder, get more, do more. You need this. You're not enough yet. You should be more of that. And don't you know? And it's going to be like this in five years' time if you don't do that. And, uh, 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 you know. <laughs> and really, all you can say is, well, 
you know, I can't deal with five years' time. I can deal with now. And if I get clear enough now, and keep getting clear enough now, in five years' time I'll be clear, won't I? I'll deal with it then, you know. You can only really enhance your, the, the way you are now. And so it's concentration is actually very, very logical and necessary, uh, not just some kind of, um, you know, thing to, to do to discover some obscure truth, but just the clear and, and heal and soothe and create ease in the system. And because of that, we can get this other aspect, cultivation of wisdom. And wisdom, again, it's a very kind of heady sort of term. It's just, uh, you know, the ability to to know um, any particular moment what's accurate and what's not accurate, what's true and what's not true. You know, is this green or is it yellow? You know, you know boom. That's wisdom. <laughs> Differentiate. It's not necessarily profound acad- academic wisdom. And what's called the, the most useful or far-reaching form of wisdom, parama, one's, for one's highest welfare, is the wisdom of insight. Mm. And this becomes possible when one's mind is collected and composed wisdom of insight because you start to begin to experience as your mind gets collected and composed you know you start to experience the your your life your presence your the present moment who you are whatever however it is where you are what you are how you are from the position of clear composed awareness rather than from thoughts and ideas and memories and suppositions and wishes and wants and regrets and you know if onlys and biases you start to see it as it actually is and at any given moment we can experience there's a sense of presence what does that mean presence now, here, something. Mm. You could call it I am present. Seems to be a sense of here I am. This. And we can experience something, a kind of quality of clarity. I can know, yeah, here I am. Not anywhere else. It's this, it's clear, it's accurate. And we can also experience a quality of a kind of uh, ease. Because instead of, I'm like this, but I should be like that, and if only, no, it's just, ah, there's a relaxation of just being as it is. So it's easeful. And you can enjoy it. Now when we come into... In presence, something you begin to develop through cultivating mindfulness of the body. You're coming into the present moment, how the body is. This is our entry into it. The bodies are good for that, because you can feel them very distinctly. And as you experience your body, first of all, it's all kinds of different things. All kinds of twinges and pulses and sensations and feelings and, you know, running around and it seems to be a whole range of things and one thing that it becomes apparent it's not is the thing you see with your eyes <laughs> the point of your awareness that visual image that does not cover it that's good for some things good for buying clothes good for passport photographs but the you know more far reaching truth of it is that visual impression really doesn't go very far because when you come into it with awareness you wait a minute no that bit there's a kind of pulse here and a sensation there and a warmth here and a twinge there and a pulse and I'm dealing with this feeling experience of a, of a body which is not one thing at all a lot of it's kind of stressful you know yeah 
And I, I'm in here with this. I'm very much engaged with it. It's happening to me. And so with calming and mindfulness of breathing, you begin to clear that. The quality of, of the energy that comes with the breathing and a sense of cons- cultivated attention your body begins to unify, the body impression begins to unify into being just a clear sense of presence. It's definitely a kind of a hearness. Uh, it seems tangible, and we begin to recognize, oh, there are sensations that happen within this experience. Mm. The sensations run through this, feelings run through it, but... There's a, co- a field, you could say, a body consciousness, which is just this. It's present. It has a certain sense of uh, solidity or stability to it. And further, you, you know, when we start to, where am I in this? You realize, well... Everything you can discern in terms of bodily experience is what? Is something that you kind of relate to. You feel there's a pressure there. So there's some resistance to it. A lot of it, we're experiencing, if you like, boundaries. We feel contained in the body. We feel contained by sensations. Sometimes we feel really trapped in it. As your mind gets clearer and finer, as your awareness becomes more apparent, it says, no, you're not trapped in sensations. Sensations arise within your awareness, within your aware body. They arise as you sustain awareness instead of reacting to the sensations. They move, they pass, they change. Mm. And moreover, there's, you can't find any particular center in that. There's no person in there <laughs> being afflicted by things. It's just there's an undivided sense of presence. And, and something happens, movements, you keep coming back to that. It's easeful. It's one kind of body. Yeah, obviously it's a visual body. You can see with your eyes. Uh, if you're a doctor, you'd probably see another kind of body. If you're a, if you're a fashion designer, you'd see another kind of body. Um, so on. There are all kinds of bodies, really. <laughs> but the, the best kind of body... <laughs> The one that's for your highest welfare is it's called knowing just this body is just this. And it's empty, it's a sense of presence, it's stable, it feels easeful. And the Buddha said there's no kind of body better than this one. You, you know, if you go into a shoe shop and say I am presence and ease, it'll be useless. They want the size of your foot. Then you've got to say, I'm a 10 or whatever it is. But most of the time, we're not in shoe shops. So, you know, there, there are different kinds of bodies. And this is, the, this is the one that's for your highest welfare. You keep coming back to that time and time again. When these other kinds of bodies take over <laughs> and become problematic. <laughs> Sick bodies. <laughs> Aging bodies. <laughs> Pain bodies, you know, you keep coming back to that one. Because it's the biggest one. The Buddha, it's like the Buddha's teachings, the elephant's footprint, all the other ones fit inside it. So this presence body, pain bodies, pleasure bodies, old bodies, young bodies, size 10, size 12, whatever it is, all fit inside that. And you can keep coming back to that. A lot of our practice is just that, coming back to that. Time and time again. And you begin to not just experience a sense of ease, but also begin to really 
look into those attitudes and energies that keep throwing into these very throwing attention to these very limited bodies you know get absorbed in but very limited small bodies you know you know people do all kinds of things just getting their noses straightened and uh, or their you know silicon implants in their breasts or something well yeah 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 but how far is that going to go <laughs> in terms of giving you happiness <laughs> you know and you get really focused on one particular point and get oh, so make so much out of it <laughs> and you know and think that and that that quality of obsessing with details rather than going into the bigger picture. That's why it's easeful, because we keep going back to something that's fundamental, grounded, always here, which is much more useful than something you've got to really, you know, try and build up and have go, you know, some little detail of the body that you've got to try and keep going, you know, against all odds. Dyeing your hair, you know, having another facelift, trying to keep the thing in shape. <laughs> you know, things people do with bodies. <laughs> so it's easeful to just to know the most fundamental and basic body is just this body present. <laughs> and you can go through a lifetime with that one. And it's not going to change. <laughs> Just as good. In fact, it gets better. You know, the more as you get older, the better it gets because the other ones <laughs> you lose in, you lose interest in them. <laughs> they give up on that one. <laughs> and you need to cultivate meditation. You know, then you're going right to that, and you, you're finding the best kind of body you can have. Mm. And it's, it's also extremely, one thing that's so good about that is it, it gives you a very accurate uh, sense of what's happening in your mind. Mm. Mm. It acts as a balance to the mind. When the mind comes into that, it feels grounded, it feels secure, it feels stable. Mm. And you, oh, you know, you're getting a bit you know, up in your head or excited or worried or frenzy and you just come back into the body and oh, you, know, you can feel that the energy running in the, in the body, in that body and then you begin to clear it. It stands out. It stands out. You can feel the shock waves running through that and you can, coming into that, breathing in, breathing out, feeling the wholeness, you begin to discharge the stress and the ripple effects of the mind, the juddering and the lurching. Mm. So this is why it's such a useful body. <laughs> mm. And the jitta, the awareness, fills that. It becomes almost uh, the same thing. It's an embodied mind. Mind is a body that's full of, full of awareness. An awareness that's taken on the strength of the of of the body. Mm. And you get clear because what needs to be known, really? And there's different kinds of things to be known, aren't there? History, geography, math, physics, chemistry, and all kinds of things to be known. What's the highest thing to be known? What's the thing that's most feel well for all the time and surely it's whether you're getting stressed, confused losing balance or not and that's what insight's about it's about really seeing this focusing on this wisdom when you're getting stressed when you're you're really clear when things are true or when things are assumed presumed guessed Hoped, biased. Hmm. What is there to know anyway?
this is a quite a challenge actually that you know less and less with uh, the process towards Nibbana the idea is you know less and less and less <laughs> less and less stuff less and less thought is happening I mean you're not getting stupid but you're beginning to know realise the simplest most obvious most fundamental things mm. stress <coughs> pressure resistance release mm. craving wanting needing contentment mm. doubt worry depression anxiety comfort release you knowing that that's what you need to know mm. Other things you need to know for particular purposes, but this one covers everything, doesn't it? A kind of clarity to know what you need to know. And one of the hinge points with this is you begin to recognize that the sensations, the thoughts, what you need to know really need to know is that they come and they go they don't arrive at anything conclusive they're not they're not a final thing in themselves they don't arrive at some way that's that's ultimate or complete or satisfied or finalized they just arrive at another thing and keep going and they don't define you you're they're not some statement about who you are they're just phenomena they're just things that happen so all those voices that tell you who you are and what you're not who are they talking about <laughs> talking about themselves aren't they talking about their memories they're talking about their assumptions about you they're talking about what they say about you they decide you're something, you're this. Having decided you're this, they say, but that's not good enough. You should be this. Having decided that you're that, they say, well, you're that, you know. That's not very good. You could be this. And having decided that you're not this, they say, you're not this, you know. You should be this, but you're not. So, and you think, is this true? Huh? Huh? Is it true? Is it right? Hmm? Is it somewhat true? Occasionally true? A little bit true? What's the highest kind of truth? The most useful kind of truth is to know these are thoughts, these are impressions, these are moods, these are emotions. That's what they are. And you realize that clarity which can know that. You don't have to know who you are. You don't have to judge who you are. You don't have to make a comparison about who you are. You don't have to have a, enter a tribunal to defend who you are. Or enter a contest to prove who you are. Or go to someone to ask how good you are. Whether you're, or find some, some way of knowing how good you are. You don't need to do that. Because all you'll ever find, if you do that, is another set of thoughts, another set of moods that will say, well, maybe you're this, but then again you could be that. And, but she's like that. And I've heard somebody else say it's really like that. That's all you'll find. You won't actually find anything that finally is enough. So you don't need to know who you are. You don't need to know how you are. You don't need to compare. You don't need to be good enough. You don't need to fit into those thoughts. You know, it's great, isn't it? <laughs> because whenever, if I think of myself, I generally start comparing myself with somebody else. 
or a standard, what I could be. Or I measure where, what I th- think I was like five years ago. Or I'm concerned about what I will be in five years' time. Or I wonder what I should do with myself. I forgot anywhere. Hmm? So, as soon as you start thinking about yourself, the madness starts. Because <laughs> you're not thinking about yourself, you're thinking about your thoughts. <laughs> When you start thinking about thoughts, <laughs> then new thoughts arise to think about the thoughts you just thought, including how to stop thinking about the thoughts you just thought. But you're not thinking about yourself, really, because you, you can't think about yourself. Because you are yourself. <laughs> you can't place that into something. It's like, if your hand's holding a spoon, you can hold a spoon, but you can't hold your hand, can you? Because your hand's doing the holding. So, you know, you're, you're, so you can't say what you are, because there you are being it. <laughs> and yet a lot of the time, that's kind of what, what we're doing, either consciously or subconsciously, or measuring, or, you know. So this is what anatta means means you can't, don't bother. You're not self. Don't bother saying it. Don't bother trying to make it anything. But that not bothering, as you know, is not such an easy matter because it's such a habit. So really cultivating what is it with a clarity and the pr- that can know this is a thought, this is a mood, this is wanting, this is resisting, this is changing. And presence is a big part of that, because the presence gives you a sense of the kind of steadiness that helps you to be clear. Because the way that thoughts and emotions take over is they create a certain turmoil. The turmoil starts to rock things around, and then we're, like, we're rolling in the turmoil, trying to find stability in the turmoil trying to find a stable thought, a stable idea, a stable definition. But those definitions and ideas are coming out of turmoil. You can't find stability in them. Because they are the result of the eddying and whirling and spinning and, and you yeah, know, when, when the real stability, there isn't anything to define. Yeah. So you can't, you know, the highest kind of clarity is knowing nothing, defining nothing, saying nothing. But it is clear, it's bright, it's open, it's not dull, dumbed down, stupid. And because, you know, so much of the knowing is really trying to tell us about ourselves. So with this insight, you begin to really understand. You don't, you can't do it, you don't need to do it, and it's a bad habit. (laughs) Because it leads to suffering and stress. This is really helpful because once one is, the mind is not into that self-preoccupation, chasing its own shadows and running after its own footprints, the relief and the openness of that means the quality of heart can be clear and open, warm-hearted. Mm. 
When the sense of self takes over, there can be bias, mind, worry, how are, are you good, am I good enough for you, jealousy, she's got something I don't have, competition, I'm going to prove I'm as good as that guy. Mm. Yeah. If that isn't there, if one's relieved of that, if one's relieved of that, trying to find something to support one's self-image on an unconscious or sub- subconscious or conscious way, what do you think the heart could be like? You know, free of that. All that kind of uh, energy that goes into... Um, kind of formations of self is free and the kind of quality of ease and happiness and it doesn't it doesn't hold it tends to it tends to radiate mm-hmm. like in that one of those sayings beautiful sayings verses in the uh, Sangyutta Nikaya, and it says, you know, these are, they don't worry about the past. They don't hanker after the future. They live in present arising, in that which presently arises. Therefore, they are radiant. Mm. So the, the shining radiance of the mind, when it's not radiance of awareness when it's not in this turning itself round in circles this is ease and really important to, to just kind of keep bearing in mind this isn't something you get it doesn't arrive at the, at, through that getting program you know how do I get the joy going <laughs> you know which is understandable because that's the way <laughs> we've learned to operate. How do I how do I get the good stuff to happen? It's how do I clear away the confusions that stop it happening? That stop the natural ease of the mind. And this is what insight is about. Insight sounds kind of intelligent doesn't it yeah. <laughs> like how brainy do you have to be but it's really just pointing at particular characteristics yeah, with wisdom like this causes stress this is changeable it's not an ultimate truth at all this statement about self and other is impermanent it's changeable it's not something to rely upon and you can't define anything in terms of self. It just doesn't work. It doesn't arrive anywhere complete. So knowing this, seeing this, and that which can see it, that which can feel it, which can feel and see that, can it abandon those ways of operating? Can it abandon them? Can it abandon the underlying causes of that, the uncertainty, the disconnects, the loss of clarity, the loss of composure, the loss of heart. Can we remedy that so that in the fullness we're no longer chasing shadows and creating more. It won't.